Hey guys, it's Ray Ray. I hope you're doing well today. Now, this video is a very, very special video for me personally. This is the first in a series of natal chart interpretations that I'm going to be doing in regards to some influential figures throughout our history, but also some people who are living today as well. You know, I'm going to let you guys decide who I do the next interpretation on. But just to get the ball rolling, I've chosen the very first person that I'd like to do this for, okay? And that person is none other than Paramahansa Yogananda. Now, for those who don't know who Yogananda is, he was born January 5th, 1893 in Gorakhpur, India. He was one of the very first Indian yogis who came over to the West, came over to America to spread the teachings of Eastern spirituality in Hindu yoga, especially, and to really unite the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita and the yoga science taught by Krishna and the Vedas with the teachings of, of, co of course, Jesus Christ. So yeah, he did come to America and he established what is known today as the Self-Realization Fellowship, okay? And he wrote many spiritual books, the most famous being, of course, his autobiography of a yogi. This is, in my opinion, the greatest spiritual book ever written. And those who have not read it yet are really doing themselves an injustice. Highly recommend it. And the link to purchase this book um, will be in the description below, okay? Now, Yogananda came from a lineage of gurus and this lineage of gurus the very first guru in that lineage was Maharavata Babaji who is said to be an eternal being you know who is still living today he takes on many forms he's a you know a Maharavata so he's a full incarnation of God of the divine Thus, he isn't bound or limited by any of the illusions that time and space inflict, up, inflict upon our consciousness. He is beyond all of that. Thus, he is deathless. He is known as the deathless yogi. So in the 19th century, he awoken he, his, one of his disciples from past lives, Lahiri Mahashai, to help resurrect the Kriya Yoga science, which had been lost during the dark age of Kali Yuga. But now that we've moved back into Dwapara Yuga, which is the age of energy and the age of consciousness itself, you know, that science of, you know, self-mastery and the mastery of our life force energy, you know, is ready to come back into full consciousness. And thus, Lahiri Mahashai helped spread the Kriya Yoga science around India. Lahiri Mahashai's, one of his disciples was Sri of Teshwar Giri, and he also became a master and a great exponent of the Kriya Yoga science. He was known as a Jan avatar, which is an avatar of wisdom or knowledge. He was also a master astrologer as well. But Yogananda was Sri Yukteswar's um, disciple. However, Yogananda's parents were actually disciples of Lahiri Mahashai, the guru of his guru. So you can see how, you know, this lineage helped pass the Kriya Yoga science from generation to generation. And of course, the lineage did end with Yogananda Ji. He came to America. He was sent to America by Babaji and by Jesus Christ to, to unite the teachings of Krishna and the Bhagavad Gita with the teachings of Christ himself. Now, when I first heard that Jesus Christ had sent Yogananda to air, to you know really help people to see that these two great religions are saying the same thing ultimately i didn't believe him i was raised catholic you know but when i stumbled upon his teachings everything just resonated with me but i didn't understand why at the time and being raised catholic you know with that catholic upbringing and a lot of those that catholic programming in the subconscious mind you know, telling me that anything that's not of Jesus Christ is of the devil, blah, blah, blah. You know, at first I had some doubts, I'll admit that. But one night I had a dream. I went to bed and I had this dream where I was met by Jesus Christ along with Paramahansa Yogananda. 
they both came to me in the same dream. And Jesus said these words to me. Follow his teachings and meditate every day. He actually said those words to me. And ever since then, I've done my best, of course. I haven't been the greatest disciple. <laughs> um, but, you know, I've been an ardent follower of Yogananda and his philosophy, for sure. He's definitely been the biggest inspiration in my life, personally. And his natal chart, which I'm going to show you in a moment, um, aligns with mine to show that in, he was indeed my teacher in previous lives. So it is a great honor and a privilege to um, interpret his natal chart for you today, just to give you a little bit of an insight of, on his life and the things that he did, of course. And maybe you'll feel inspired to want to connect to him as well after this video. Now, when examining the chart of an ascended master or a being, we have to look at it from a higher point of view, of course, because it's not necessarily what you have in the chart that counts. It's what you do with what you have that counts. So an enlightened soul is going to use the planets and points in their chart in a completely different way than the average person is. It's just a fact. No judgment there. You know, an enlightened being is going to utilize all of their potential. They're going to maximize their potential. Most people don't do that in one incarnation. Yogananda did. But that's because he'd already come into this life fully liberated. So the South Node, for example, takes on a completely different form. Because in a, in a normal person's chart, the South Node represents, you know, um, some of the tendencies um, that they're bringing in from the past into the present life that they've yet to overcome. A lot of the, the challenges and habits and, you know, attitudes, etc. But in the chart of an Ascended Master, the South Node represents a vortex through which the accumulation of all the wisdom that they've attained in previous lives can really come through. Okay. So keep that in mind. We've got to look at this chart from a higher perspective because this isn't a, an ordinary person. This is somebody who, like I just said, maximize their potential and become one with the divine on a conscious level. I say conscious level because we are all one with the divine. We just don't know it. Most people just don't remember the fact that they are a wave upon the infinite ocean of consciousness. With any chart reading, I always like to begin with the ascendance because the ascendance is the karmic doorway through which, you know, the soul enters this realm. The ascendance or the personality, in a sense, is the interface between which the consciousness and the world of form meets because it's through your personality that you have a physical reality experience. You can't have a physical reality experience without one. You know, we need an ego. You know, the difference between a normal ego and an enlightened ego is that the enlightened ego becomes a channel through which the divine can express itself without this, without distortion. For normal people, that can happen sometimes, but the shift isn't permanent. Sometimes, you know, negative beliefs and fear-based emotions get in the way. Okay, so Yogananda has a Virgo ascendant, okay? Now, the higher expression of Virgo in energy, of course, is to be extremely detail-oriented. Virgo is a mercur mercurial sign, of course. It's ruled by the sign of Mercury, which governs over not only one's communicative qualities and skills, but also their perception of reality as well. And perception is ultimately power. However, Yogananda's personality is in Virgo as well. So his personality, you know, from a higher perspective, Virgo is a very perfectionist kind of sign, okay? They want to be perfect in everything that they want to do. Now, this to me is, is an example of somebody who really perfected themselves, ultimately, because we're looking at this from a higher point of view again. I'm not saying all Virgo risings have perfected themselves, of course not. But when you look at a chart of a master, and especially when the chart ruler, which is um, which is Mercury in Sagittarius, you know, it goes to show that this being's personality became a clear channel through which the wisdom of their higher self could express itself through. Okay, because um, Sagittarius is of course the sign of the higher self. Yeah. And of course, Sagittarius also represents foreign lands, foreign cultures, 
you know, religion as well, conventional religion. Um, and Yogananda was a great exponent of all the world's great religions. And he had this really unique ability of enabling people to see how they're all saying the same thing, just in different ways. You know, the truth is the truth, no matter where you go. The truth is Sanatan. And that's what the um, the Vedas like to call the truth, Sanatan Dharma. Sanatan Dharma means the eternal truth. And the truth is always, if it's not eternal, then it's not the truth. Yeah. But no matter where you go in the universe, even if you go to other star systems, the truth is still the same. And that eternal truth that Sanat and Dharma teaches, which all true religions actually do teach as well, is that we are all one with God. We are all a wave upon the infinite ocean of consciousness. And we're all one being as well, because consciousness or spirit is the very fab fabric or substance of existence itself. And each of us are a wave upon that ocean. So that is Sanat and Dharma. And this is what Yogananda became a great exponent of. Through his books, such as um, The Second Coming of Christ and God Talks with Arjuna especially, he helped really unite the teachings of Jesus and Krishna. Now, on the surface level, these teachings may seem very different, you know, but you've got to understand the audience through which each of those beings were addressing their message to. Jesus incarnated on this planet in a very, very dark age, full of religious superstition and ignorance, let's be honest. The Jews of his time were extremely dogmatic. You know, they believed that if they just followed the Lord of Moses blindly, that they'd be liberated from all their sins or whatever. Obviously, that didn't work. And Jesus came to correct a lot of their misunderstandings, so to speak. But he never really veered away from the truths that Moses also taught them. He just helped them see them from a higher perspective. Now, some people really vibed with that. Other people didn't. And obviously, they had them crucified in the end because they just couldn't face the fact that somebody who was a rebel, Jesus was a rebel. You know, Jesus was very rebellious. Somebody come in and just told them straight up, this is not how you do it. And they just could not stand that. And obviously, they had him killed. Krishna incarnated in, you know, a few thousand years before Christ did. In a higher age of consciousness, you know, Atlantis was the peak of human consciousness. That was the golden age. But then we began to descend into the silver age and the bronze age. And then, you know, but Krishna was in the bronze age, which is still significantly um, greater than the Kali Yuga or dark age Jesus was in. So people's understanding was a little more advanced in those times, especially. And that's why if you read the Bhagavad Gita, you'll see, I'm not saying that Krishna's teachings are in any way, shape or form more, more advanced than Jesus's. Not at all. You know, they're saying the same thing. But the beautiful thing about the Bhagavad Gita is that its essence hasn't been distorted by mistranslations. And, you know, it, India's spiritual treasures are being kept. They're being kept in their pure state, and that's the beautiful thing. The Bhagavad Gita, when you read it, it, it really does read like a song, and the words Bhagavad Gita actually mean the song of God as well, because it is a song. It is the song of the soul. It is a song of pure liberation from the illusions of time and, time and space, which Maya inflicts upon our consciousness. Now, Yogananda's descendant, then him being a Virgo rising, is obviously going to be in the sign of Pisces. Okay. Now, Yogananda, like most great spiritual masters from India, especially, you know, was a real exponent of the guru disciple relationship. And I see myself as a disciple of him because I understand that a lot of these yoga teachings that are from India, from the East, really, you know, they can be dangerous if you misuse them. You know, so it's important to have a man of wisdom or a woman of wisdom. My physical living guru is actually a female, you know, but she's also connected to Yogananda. I was sent to her. But anyway, it's important to have somebody who knows what they're talking about, who's been through what you, you are going through, who has achieved the goals that you wish to achieve you know, on this path. Otherwise, you can fall into many of the trapdoors that lay ahead of you on the, upon the spiritual path. 
Yogananda, like I said before, came from a lineage of gurus. So his um, descendant ruler is Neptune in Gemini, okay, which indicates that the most significant as in relationship of his life was the one he had with his spiritual teacher, Neptune in Gemini. But it also shows that he too would become a spiritual teacher eventually. And of course, that's what happened. Now let's talk a little more about the South Node. Um, he does have the South Node in Scorpio. As a lot of you astrologers already know, Scorpio is the most um, transformative, but also intense sign of the Zodiac in many ways, because it represents the deepest and darkest aspects of, you know, human nature of our psyche. Scorpio is ruled by Pluto, the, the furthest planet from the sun. Okay. And the reason why Pluto was associated with the sign of Scorpio is because Pluto is shrouded in the most darkness. And so too is the eighth house and the Scorpionic energy as well. Now, this doesn't mean that Yogananda is some dark kind of thing, not at all. But his Uranus in conjunction with the South Node in Scorpio indicates complete self-mastery over Scorpionic consciousness. And what is Scorpionic consciousness? Sexual energy. Yogananda lived a celibate life. Um, Scorpionic consciousness is also adapting to the winds of change and transformation as well, you know. And Yogananda, you know, he lived a life that is, you know, a great example of that for sure. He also mastered death. Even after his passing, usually when a normal person passes away, their body instantly begins to decompose. Like many of the Catholic saints, um, Yogananda's body remained in its pure state. It actually didn't decompose, you know, and that's because his physical body had become infused with that consciousness, you know, that maintained the structure and function of his body, even though he'd left the body, of course. And he also chose when he died as well. He, he experienced what is called the Maha Samadhi, where, where the yogi sits in a meditative posture and leaves their body consciously. They decide when they want to go. They decide when it's all over. You know, so he also mastered life and death. You know, and he came to show all of us that we can do the same. Now let's focus on his North Node a little bit. He does have a he did have a Taurus North Node, of course. The Taurus North Node really does, you know, from a higher point of view again, a higher expression. Taurus is ruled by um, Venus. Venus is the goddess of love, of course. So through creative love and also the transmutation of sexuality into divine love, you know, this is something you know Yogananda did. Um, teach his disciples or his disciples who lived with them at the hermitage or in the um, the lake shrine in America or the ashram as some people like to call it and um, they were all celibate he he never allowed the men the monks and the the male monks and the female monks to interact with one another unless you know they needed to to do to do their work you know, they all were taught to live a celibate life and to really master their life force energy. And again, that is, you know, really what the Scorpio, Scorpio and Taurus axis is all about. On one side, you've got the Scorpionic, you know, sexual aspect. And on the other side, you've got the divine love of Taurus. And of course, because he'd already mastered the Scorpionic aspect of consciousness, you know, and of course, he'd already mastered the Taurus aspect as well, but he found that perfect balance. And really, he could probably, in his meditative states, when he entered the Samadhi state, feel intoxicating levels of bliss and joy that really put, you know, physical sexual orgasms to shame. So why even pursue that when, you know, there's greater joys within yourself? And this is something that he also taught his disciples through his Kriya Yoga practice, of course. By the way, his Kriya Yoga lessons are available on Self-Realization Fellowship's website. Um, they are amazing, and I do recommend them. But before you do that, I would recommend reading his autobiography first. Now, the North Node ruler is in Sagittarius as well. As I said before, Sagittarius rules all things foreign, foreign lands, foreign cultures, etc. 
But isn't it funny that most of the work that he done, his destiny really was away from his homeland. And the North Node ruler is in Sagittarius. So he spent most of his time in America spreading the Kriya Yoga science and helping liberate people from the, you know, the illusions that Maya inflicts upon their consciousness. Ultimately, he come to unite the teachings of the East and the West, and he also had a magazine out while he was alive called East West, which did just that as well. It's funny that he came to America as well, because when we look, America's um, son is in Cancer, but Yogananda's son is in Capricorn, and it is in direct opposition with America's son. So his way of life, his way of being was completely opposite, you know, to the American way of um, life. You know, he was a strange Hindu yogi who came to a very foreign land, you know, and he was ridiculed by many people. He wasn't accepted by many. Many tried to frame him. Many tried to, um, you know, belittle his work, etc. But the spirit and the divine love ultimately prevail, prevailed and since he came to America, even beyond his passing, he's helped transform the lives of millions. He also has an amazing grand fire trine in his chart, okay? He has Jupiter in Aries on one point. Jupiter in Aries represents a spiritual leader, potentially, but from a higher plane of existence, when we're looking at a chart from a higher point of view, this is definitely what it means. Aries is the sign of um, leadership, and Jupiter is spirituality, of course. That Jupiter is also trying in his Venus and his Mercury, which really helped him get into that state where he's channeling, you know, from the quantum field um, beyond time and space, he's able to tap in to tune into many of the beings who lived before him and to really pull information from them. He had that um, gift and, and ability instinctively. But also this grand fire trine really pl places special emphasis upon his Leo moon, okay? Because his Leo moon is in the 12th house of spirituality as well. But really what he came here to do was also to help other people or to encourage people to see God as a divine mother instead of a, you know, a father. Because Western civilization for a few thousand years has been conditioned to believe that God the Father is this wicked, evil, jealous old God, you know, who judges us, etc. And that's really because of the Old Testament, you know, and many Christians' perception of God, which is very fear-based, let's be honest. So he helped come, he come to America to help um, people to see God as a loving mother instead and a best friend. And, you know, I really prefer to see God as a mother myself, to be honest. You know, I love to connect to the Divine Mother um, and the Mother of Christ especially. But yeah, um, this great master, he really did help transform a lot of people and especially men as well he helps soften the hearts of men of course men are meant to be strong but also it's okay for men to really embrace that emotionality as well now it also has mars in aries mars in one of its ruling signs of course which again showed his great leadership qualities that he had and of course, Mars and Aries are also connected to the natural ascendant as well. So they represent one's personality. So even though through his Virgo ascendant, you know, he's very detail orientated, very sharp in his perception, etc. He also had that fiery leadership qualities as well, which enabled him to really um, help sow seeds within the minds of his disciples and help reform them. And that's exactly what he did. So yeah, that's it. If you enjoyed this chart reading, please give this um, video a like and subscribe to my channel as well. If you haven't already, I'm going to be doing more of these. Also, if you want your own chart interpreted in a similar way, as you can see, I really don't look at astrology from a mundane point of view, from an ordinary standpoint. You know, I look at the natal chart from a very evolutionary perspective because I don't use astrology for divination. I don't use astrology to try and predict the future because life exists in the here and now. Yeah. So I use astrology to help people become better versions of themselves. And that's it.
in this book, there is a chapter called Outwitting the Stars. And Yogananda himself says, because his guru was a great astrologer as well, Yogananda says the whole point of astrology is ultimately to defeat your chart, okay? To get to a point where you don't care what the stars are saying. You still do what you want to do at any given moment. You don't allow the external environment to define you, ultimately. And that's what true freedom is. And that's also what astrology should do if it's used correctly to help you be free of those external influences and to really you know, be assured inside of yourself. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this interpretation and I'll catch you again soon. Peace.